got the first step right. A couple of people skipping the first step. each other when you get them if you're going farther without the, with the wrong reactions. See how smart Dana is? Dana's right in the middle. Dana gets the reaction just from listening to you guys. Tell me the reactions. I'll pass it on. You guys agree? Oh, he's not in your club? No.
distributed load goes back in. might not be able to finish the shear curve completely and then start working on the moment curve. It might work better for you if you do a little bit at a time of which, which parts you know. Placing points as you uh, figure them out and then start using the relationships to start tying things together. And most of you have the reaction. Now I think this one's 200, right? This one's 1300.
internal cut things where you're doing if that's what you'd like that will give you the equation directly for sure and moment in that section but you might be able to speed things up a little bit if you lose the, use the relations but maybe not
go down to the math lab and ask the math professor to help you on this. mistake on the shear of the moment diagram uh, and, and you can't figure out the other to get them to be compatible, it may be that the uh, your shear or moment diagram is wrong. Don't get wedded to what you've got. You may have to adjust. So you definitely have to adjust. jump in and help a little bit here. Um, this 200 reaction here and then no load distribution in that first half, that should be pretty easy to do on the shear diagram. You go up the direction of the load, so we go up 200, and just get my scale about right, nah, that'll do. And then what's shear doing in that section, A to B? just goes constant like that. And that's that's 200 there. Now on the back side we've got sort of the same situation. We've got a, a force right at the end, no load distribution in between. And so we should be able to draw that side Two, we're, we're going to come down 300 to finish at the end of the beam. So 
that would be something like about that. And then as we go in, it's zero slope again because there's no load distribution. So those two ends are pretty, pretty easy to do, I hope. Certainly easy to do when you see them. Well, hang on, let's, let's back up here because you don't have what I have. When there's no load distribution, there's no distributed load, then the slope of the shear curve is zero. So the distributed load is zero, the slope of the shear curve is zero. So that's what I've got for those the two end sections. How's this look? We also know though there's a point load here of 1300 newtons that's up. So we're going to jump up 1300 newtons to get to that point. So uh, we know we can go down to here about minus, uh, that'd be minus a thousand. takes care of everything but the distributed load. Right? This, this jump from minus 1,000 up to 300 is the same as this jump of 300 at the point load the reaction causes. The, the shear curve jumps in the same direction as the loads do. Let's see what we can figure out on the moment diagram. For example, uh, do we even know what the moment is at any of the points? Do we know what the moment is here? It's zero because it's a simple pin support that there can be no moment at that point. So we know that's true. What about the other end? Also zero. It's just a free end out there. There's there's no there's nothing causing it to bend in any way. No moment would be there. So we, we've got those two points. We know in between, since the shear is constant, then the slope is constant. So it's a straight line going from zero up at a slope of 200. So where does it end? Can we figure out that? The easiest way to draw a straight line is if you have the two endpoints. So it goes up at a slope of 200. So we know somewhere up here we're going to end on the moment diagram. Do we know where? Well, remember the change in moment is the area under the shear, shear curve between any two points. So between here and here, the area is 200 times 6, 1,200. So we know that it goes up to 1,200. And is linear in between. Because the shear is constant in between. So we know that. You can do that kind of thing on the other end as well. So see if that doesn't help you out a little bit. Fiona, did that make sense compared to yeah, what you had? I don't know how to turn. I, I guess my shear in the middle is where I'm getting yeah. stuff just in general. Yeah, and uh, with with changing distributed loads, the curves are, the, the diagrams are a little bit hard. So you have to, uh, you have to work those out. So I'm going to leave it to you. I got you that far, I'll leave you a little bit.
remember your those relationships and don't violate them and think something's going to work out because it won't. So I'll send that that uh, that warning out to let's see. I'll direct it towards Dana right now. I'll direct it towards. Alan right now. I'll direct it towards Trevor right now. The rest of you haven't gone far enough yet to make the same mistakes they're making. And the three of you are making the same mistake. I just didn't see anyone else making it yet. There are no other jumps in the shear curve because we have no other point forces. The only thing left is the distributed force. And we know it, the shear for the distributed force starts there and ends there. There's something in between. And then the moment curve we got started because a nice positive uh, constant shear there. See if you can finish it with the same thing, same idea. So now when you've done that much, then you can just start to sketch things in a little bit easier.
Remember the load is the slope of the shear curve minus the load is the slope of the shear curve. We have a 300 here. So the slope of the shear curve right here is minus 300. So it's very steep. Then the slope of the shear curve here is equal to minus the load curve. It's minus 100. It's not as steep. What kind of shape does it have in between? What, Dan? Parabolic. If this is linear, if this is linear, then the slope is or the, the value of the shear is parabolic. So that you can just sketch in. What? That's what I said in the beginning. I just couldn't figure out if it was going to be concave up or concave down. That's the only way. If you go by the slopes at the ends, that's the only thing that'll work. Because you know slopes on both of these are negative because both of those are positive there. Does that make sense? Now you see it? And so you don't have to actually do this. This can work, but it's confusing some of you. Now, uh, the trouble with it is we don't have this exact curve. That would be nice. But, uh, but we could get it, because if we had this equation for the load curve, then we could uh, integrate it and we get the, uh, the slope. So we already know that the slope is minus 33 and a third x. What's the intercept? Here, back six meters, we go up 200. We go back another six, we go up another 200. It's 500. So now we can say that the change in shear will be minus the area under the load curve, which we now have. 3300 x plus 500 dx between what limits? Between 6 and, well, if we do it to x, that will give us the shear as a function of x. And we'll do it from 6 meters just up to x. If we do that integration, then we'll have the function that gives us the change in shear uh, from that point. Then we'd actually have that curve. integration is let's see do I have it that way Divided by 2 is what? 16, 7. 
x squared we got, uh, minus 500x, a value weighted between 6 and some spot x greater than 6. And that's positive, so now you know it's concave up. And you know the shear ends at 12, or sorry, uh, 200. So we can find out delta V from any at any other point. So you can get you can get this the now the the shear curve. Easier said than done, I know, but doable. Now, what else? We know we finish here with the moment curve. How do we get to that point? From in here, how do we get to this point? A straight line, a constant, a polynomial of some kind. How do we get from in here to there where we finish? Let's see. The value of the shear is the slope of the moment curve. The value of the shear is plus 300. So how do we get to this point? A straight line of plus 300 comes into it. Let's see, that was about 200, so this is a bit steeper. It's going to go something like that, right? So a lot of you had it up here. It finishes the right point, but it's not a minus slope, it's a plus slope. So uh, the area under there is 1800. So we know that we're going to finish down here at minus 1800 to get back up to zero. Then the only question comes, how do we get in between the two? Do we have a jump in this curve? as we continue? Or do we just have a change in slope and a change in function? What's the only thing that will cause a jump in this curve? There's only one thing that will cause a jump in this curve. By that I mean we would start somewhere else as we continue. Yeah, a, a moment, an applied moment in the in the problem itself, which we don't have. So we know we continue from this spot and finish at that spot with no big jumps in between. In fact, the load changes smoothly in between, the shear changes smoothly in between, so the moment's going to change smoothly in between. We just don't know exactly how it's going to do it. So let's see if we can figure out. Let's see. Uh, the shear is the slope of the moment curve. The shear is positive here but decreasing. In fact, it, it starts with the very same slope it finished with because there's no jump here, but then decreases. So we know it's going to start bending over somehow. We know what about the moment curve right there at this spot? I'll draw it in blue. What's true about the moment curve where the shear is zero? It's the, the slope is part of, okay, 
So that makes sense with with a decreasing slope. We we know we're going to start curving over. Then the slope is negative, but barely negative. We're only a little bit negative here. But then it gets increasingly negative until it ends up down here. So that's going to be some kind of curve like that then, some kind of uh, some kind of a cubic because that's linear. So this is quadratic. So this is cubic. It's going to look something like that. With a maximum right there. And the hatching just uh, allows us to more easily see what's positive and negative. Uh, it's not as important for shear and the design of the beam what's positive or negative, but for the sh for moment, designing the beam itself is very important if we know which way it's bending because uh, that would tell us if we were using reinforced concrete how we place the reinforcing rods. If you have a concrete beam that's bending this way, you want the reinforcing rods along the bottom. If you have a beam that's bending the other way, the reinforcing rods would go along the top. And so we need to know where we have positive and negative moment. We'll talk about why we do this and just how we design for it uh, next spring. There you go. Everybody did it. See, you did it. Aren't you proud of yourself? You did it. A little help. Yeah. And it, it saved us from having to do any of those by using those relations. So they're, they're very useful, but I do understand they can be confusing. So 